name is Joyce Underwood, and I am the chair of the Facilities Dispensation and Site Remediation Committee, and this is our meeting. And today is August 14th, in case you didn't know. Hey, look, I'm loud now. Um, so we have recommendations after all that that went on before. We have two recommendations. Um, one of them is by me. Where's Larry? He's not here to help me. <laughs> no. And one of them is by Dan. So I guess I will. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> so the first one is me. So just read it. No, do you want to do the committee update and everything oh. first? I, I'm doing it. I'm going through it. It no, says no, review I mean, like previous committee meeting Avery's discussions. Avery's update. Oh yeah, you need to talk. Sorry, I'm just. Oh yeah. Oh, no, I want to hear from you. Okay, Avery Hammett, DOE. I have a few things to update you on today. Um, one of them is kind of cool. On June 25th, an SRNS contractor began the inspections of the inside of our fire water tanks on site, and they did this via teams of divers who went into the tanks and vacuumed up any sediment that might be present and then did a 360 top to bottom visual inspection of the tanks and some on the spot repairs with underwater epoxy and a tool that was a pneumatic grinder. Uh, and three of the tanks needed some on the spot repairs. And the inspections of the final two tanks resumed this week, so that will make seven total that the divers have gone in and inspected. So I thought that was kind of interesting. A little neat maintenance and ties into the infrastructure. Hi, if you're on the phone with us, could you please mute your phone? Uh, Thank you. Anyway, so it ties in with our infrastructure discussions that we sort of have running through the theme of all of what we talk about. So I thought that was an interesting tidbit. D, uh, work on the D area ash project continues and sod is being installed as we speak or this afternoon it was on the 488 1D ash basin. And we have Karen Adams here to answer any questions that might have come out of her briefing on D area at the full board last month. So one other thing, the uh, subcontract was awarded for the design and construction of the permeable reactive barrier for the groundwater removal action in P area, which you guys have heard about, and uh, soil boring, monitoring well drilling, and cone penetrometer technology characterization activities that will support the treatability study, the, the design of the barrier, of the reactive wall, and any future removal or remedial action decision making is ongoing. And the uh, procurement activities to support the wetlands remediation at Dunbarton Bay are underway. The request for proposals should be submitted to bidders any time here in, it says early August, so I'm assuming any time now. And uh, they expect the contract to be awarded in the first quarter of fiscal year 19, which I'm sure you all know starts in October, so not calendar year. And the remedial action start date is February 19th of 2019. So that is another ASH uh, project, which I think Karen is familiar with if you have any additional questions about that. And then one last thing that I came across, and I thought this was interesting, and it might put the scope of what the cleanup uh, program at SRS is into context. So since 1993, Area Completion Projects has achieved 3,772 CERCLA milestones and RICRA permit commitments on or ahead of schedule. 66 of those have been completed in FY18 to date and seven were completed in July. So we talk a lot about D area and that that's the main remediation going on, but there's a lot of other work going on in the background that there are submittals that are due, um, uh, inspection reports, you know, checks on how the remediations are working. We have groundwater monitoring reports. We have all kinds of commitments that are due that I think get lost in the noise a little bit that you guys don't hear about. So I thought that was an interesting uh, snapshot, 3,772 milestones to date. So that kind of puts it into perspective a little bit. That's a 
tremendous amount of work. So anyway, I came across that today and I thought you might think that was interesting. And that's all I have. If anybody has any questions, I'll direct them to Karen. <laughs> Uh, Doug Howard, Tab, uh, the inspection on those, the tanks by the divers, Yes. has that been done before, is that the first time? It is, it has been done before. They're done every two to three years, depending on what type of lining the tank has, and if it has cathodic protection, and um, it's done one year after a new tank is, is uh, coated to ensure that the uh, that the coating is doing what it's supposed to do. So they're done normally on a rotating basis. This is kind of weird that they're all being done in one big lump, but um, they do happen on a regular basis. Yeah. And what were the findings again? They had all, all the reports said was on the spot corrections and I actually went down to try to track down the the team member that would have the answer to what those exactly were, but they were able to be fixed with underwater epoxy, so I'm guessing maybe just some rust spots, but I can get back to you on that. Thank you. Dan? Dan Kaninsky, <laughs> KF. A um, couple questions on the uh, ash, D area, ash uh, area. Um, first off, do we know the mowing frequency once the sod is taken root? Is that monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, annual? Semi -annual right? I believe they did it twice. Twice a year? I think it's semi-annual. Okay, thanks. And then um, the uh, new area that you mentioned. The Dunbarton Bay? Dunbarton Bay. Uh, is it too soon to know if that will be remediated in a similar manner? Will that be capped, consolidated and capped? It's consolidated and capped, is that right? No? Well, why don't you tell us? <laughs> We're gonna have to get you to get up, Karen. I'm sorry, so that we can record your response. Can you walk up to it? She can. <laughs> Hi, I'm Karen Adams. I'm with DOE. Um, isn't that what y'all say? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm new at this. Um, no, the Dunbarton Bay project. We are going to be excavating the ash and transporting and disposing of it at the Three Rivers Landfill. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? <laughs> I don't want to sit down. <laughs> not, not a, not a okay, very good. Thing. Okay. Is, sure. is that the same thing that's going to the landfill from the presentation we had before? Or is it a different thing? Um, same type of ash, different project. Different place. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's it. All right. I think so. Okay. Thanks. Um, and a third question on the milestones that you uh, mm -hmm. gave us those facts and figures. Is that a regular monitored KPI or measurable that you guys have reported on a regular basis? Absolutely, that's tracked. I feel the, the CAB would be most interested in those types of reports. Right, we get a we monthly. we love to see the progress. We get a monthly report from SRNS that summarizes all the activities for the month and keeps the running tally, so we can easily add that to the uh, talking points for the manager if you want. Um, yeah, we'd be up to. Joyce, perhaps, or sounds, or good at least the, for the next cab meeting, maybe, and then sort of periodically. It may, it may not be something you need to hear every month if there isn't a lot of activity. No, I but, agree. Um, but obviously, but yeah, we it can add that. Takes us by surprise a little bit. That uh, what was the number again? Three thousand seven hundred and seventy-two reasons to celebrate. Exactly. So. Exactly. And like I said, some of those are are very small. They're just groundwater monitoring reports, which are not small, they're actually huge documents, but they are not uh, any decision documents. And then some of those are rods and remedial decisions and things like that, so they, they have varying significance to the, to the program, but um, lots and lots of milestones. So we'll add that to the September talking points for the manager, and then maybe periodically after that, keep you guys informed of, of where maybe we are. Maybe like biannually? Yeah. Or if you know if we have a big huge surge of commitment, we can keep you in the loop on that. Is your card up? Uh, Eleanor Hobson Cab. Noticing that there has been so much wet weather. Yes, ma'am. Spring and fall. It has been well, very from wet. The fall until now, the summer, fall, spring, and so forth. Have you noticed many changes in the wetlands? Uh, 
has it affected anything in that area, the plants, the animals, uh, the terrain, right. or anything that is noticeable due to so much water accumulating? I do not know the exact answer to that for this year, but I used to work at the Savannah River Ecology Lab for, for four years while I was in college, and I can tell you from that experience that yes, you will have drastic seasonal differences in wetlands depending on the amount of rainfall. So I'm sure that the ecologists have noticed a very wet trend to the wetlands, because a lot of them dry up or shrink drastically in the, you know in the hot dry season and we just haven't had any big long stretches without rain this year which is good we've needed the rain but um, I can get you some specific information if you'd like but I can tell you from past experience many moons ago that yes we would see uh, changes um, and the wetlands would be significantly wetter than on a dry summer than in a dry summer and so. therefore would there be anything that we need to be on guard about at this point as far as um, new plants and animals showing mm -hmm. up yes um, insects and all kinds. well definitely mosquitoes thrive in <laughs> these wet summers and with them come as you know mos you know air mosquito carried diseases but um, dragonflies then their population expands to because they have a bigger food source in the mosquitoes a lot of uh, amphibians will have a population explosion in a very wet year. Um, but as far as anything of concern, I'm not aware of anything, but I can certainly check with the ecology lab and let you know if there's anything. And, and wetland plants obviously will be flourishing. But the reason that they're able to survive in these wetlands, a lot of which are seasonal, is that they do have a dormant stage that they can go in and in fact some of the amphibians do the same they can burrow down in the mud and ride out the dry the dry months until the rains come again so it's not that they necessarily would be dead otherwise you know but the pop they just will stay green and alive and functioning longer in a wet year whereas they might go dormant in a hot dry dry season so but we can definitely get you some more specifics i think dr rhodes does another presentation for you guys Yeah, he's scheduled soon? to come back in January, I believe. Oh, okay, I thought it was. The, give the full annual. I update. thought it was November, but so we'll get you an answer before that. Okay. Sure. All right. Yes, sir. I thought she had the other part of the question oh. for me, but no, great, great conversation to start up on that. Um, so with the ebb and flow of this massive amount of water, are there any areas on site that were on risk, at risk of taking contamination and sweeping it away to other areas? Has there ever been any studies with regards I to uh, some of that? I feel like SREL has probably done studies on that, but Michael, do you have any information specifically? Uh, Michael McElanis, DOE. <clears throat> We'd have to check with, I'm sure Ecology has studies on, on it, but the, we do study the effects of that, if you will, because we do monitoring all along the site throughout all, through all of the, um, the waterways that, that could lead to emissions getting off site. That's the primary pathway, would be mig migration to the groundwater or from surface runoff to the waterways <clears throat> and into the river and, um, or airborne. So we, we monitor for those. So there is the potential for it, but that's why we do monitoring. Yeah, I was just curious because we've had other waterways like right. the Mississippi, for instance, with industrial issues where the flooding comes and sweeps their ash bins right into the river. Right, right. We could um, talk to SREL for you guys and see if they have any studies that they could, you know, any papers or anything yeah, that they could share with us. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if there was sure. anything that ever showed any anomalies right. that after a certain heavy uh, water year that right. if, uh, anything popped up later at different sites around the monitoring right. areas. Right, yep, we can look into that for you. Anything else? Okie doke. Okay, thank you, Avery. Um, now, Updates about the recommendations? Yeah? 
our DDASH area project. We want to discuss things, right? Yeah. I know what I'm doing. Do we have anything that we want to discuss about D area, area ASH project that we've watched at the uh, full board meeting, ladies and gentlemen? Anything about flowers, maybe? There was a uh, Dan Kaminsky cap. There was a question during the presentation. Uh, someone had asked what was the life lifespan of the uh, material used for the barrier, and I, and I think the answer was uh, greater than 30 years. But do we have um, any more information on that? Is it is 70. 50 is greater than 30, but the answers to that are currently getting clear here and I don't know if you can clarify any more today or if we just need to wait until those responses are ready to go. Okay. Yeah, I would rather just wait yeah. until we get the responses together. There was about four or five additional questions that went along with that as well. But <coughs> she's got them in pulling and we're just trying to make sure that they're that they're specific and address what the questions really were. And then just uh, furthering the discussion on what's on top and I think we're going to see a little bit of that in the recommendations that we're going to be discussing in a few minutes. Um, the type of grass that is grown, is that an indigenous species of the area? Yes. Okay. And if it's left uh, to run its own course, how high does that typically grow and how deep of a root does it have? Does anyone know? Karen, why don't you go ahead and come on that? If you can stand if you want to, or if you want to take a seat, you can. Either way. You don't have to. We know you. Um, and this is pulling from my knowledge from raising horses, not from <laughs> closing <laughs> closing um, waste uh, sites at the at the Savannah River site. But um, usually, it will get. Um, I don't know how far down the route goes but as far as it usually is a running it runs but it also gets tall so it probably gets at least two feet tall and so um, you know that's why we you know try to get it cut a couple of times a year but also during the dormant months of the year it provides good cover um, even though it's brown and it's dormant, it still provides that cover that we need for erosion control. Right. So, um, but I can get you um, the answers for the, d the roots. Do we, like. uh, do we harvest that as hay or anything? No. no. Is that an option? Um, I don't know if we've ever considered that or not. Um, I don't know with the, um, I'm just going to say this, but oh, yeah, as do, with the, you know, get your, hay, get your hay from the Savannah River site. <laughs> eh, I don't know if that would go over very well, but I would buy it. I don't see a problem with it, especially um, the uh, contamination. If You'd it's, probably get a good deal. Yeah. Um, but the contamination is at least two and a half feet below the grass, sure. and the root system doesn't grow that far down, so, you know, you're protected from anything that it's, you know, covering. But I don't think that we would sell too much of it. <laughs> Joyce? Joyce Underwood Cab. Why do you have to cut it? Like, just for, for aesthetics? Um, for maintenance, and what I mean by that is uh, we have to walk down the cap and make sure there's no burrowing animals, there's no ant beds, there's no um, trees uh, growing because all of that can um, affect the uh, impermeability or the function of the of the cover so we have to visually we can't have really things that are too tall because we can't see I mean and we do they do mow it with you know tractors and bush hogs and everything like that but we do have to inspect it and they do walk it down and check for damage and one of the things that uh, isn't really new but it's getting more prolific is uh, the hogs root 
and so that's one of the things that we have to look for you know look for in um, and if we have something that's too you know overgrown or is not cut sometimes that's usually that's real easy to spot but you know we want to look for that damage and you know burrowing animals it seems like those are getting pretty prevalent too especially in my on my property <laughs> wait do you guys have gopher tortoises here is that a problem here more so it would be armadillos armadillos okay. I haven't really heard that more so than the you know, the hogs but I have an armadillo at my house Doug uh, Doug Howard Cap. yeah that that was uh, one of my questions I'm always curious about those hogs and um, how do you all keep those the, the hogs away from there and then the um, the uh, uh, the moles and other animals that, that I mean do you all like coordinate area, coordinate area all for I mean how is it well as far as moles maybe not so much a threat because they don't burrow so deep they're usually across the top you know you can see armadillos can be very destructive because they can go very deep um, the the hogs um, we had gotten away from putting a fence around each waste unit because used to when we closed a unit the regulators required us to put a fence around each waste unit and we thought you know what that's pretty redundant for security reasons because we're on the Savannah River site there's a fence around the whole property and we have guards right so they let us out of that and for several years that was fine and then we just uh, within the last few years the hog damage has gotten to be uh, pretty costly for us as far as maintenance of the caps and the covers and so we've gone back and now we've started placing fences around um, the waste unit and basically what they're called is hog fences you know that six inch square barbed wire on the bottom very bottom and barbed wire on the top because they will root underneath the hog fencing so they put a strand of barbed wire on the very bottom so hopefully that would detract them from going underneath so if they learn how to climb, we're in trouble. And how about deer? Do you have any problems with those? The the deer don't really seem to to affect the caps too much. The caps and the covers. Yes, Thank you. Um, Betty Cook Cab, I just wanted a question about that. I knew you had control hunters that would come in and hunt the deer. Do you do that with the wild hogs? Like yes, ma'am. Control hunters, so mm -hmm. you actually can control it to a point letting people uh, hunt. Uh, well we when they come out and do the deer hunts uh, which is probably starting up here in October through January uh, we we tell the hunters I think every hunt they go out we tell them that if you see a hog you can shoot it and so now do we just have hog hunts no ma'am but um, we do have the turkey hunts you know and for the, like the wounded warriors we do that once a year but most of the time it's um, just, you know, if you see one, and I think we do that with the coyotes as well. If you see one, you can shoot it. If you're out looking for a deer, help us out, you know. So, um, but that's pretty much the, the only, um, well, and we also set traps for them. Usually that's not as effective. We Thank have you. like the big cages. But if they became a problem, that might be something you would look into doing maybe? Um, I, I don't know. I could look into that and see. I don't know if that's, Michael looks like he's got an answer for sure. you. <clears throat> Michael McElaine's Department of Energy. Actually, the, in addition to the hog hunt, the hog hunt, see, now I'm doing it. <laughs> in addition to the deer hunts and the turkey hunts where you can shoot hogs, the Forest Service, which manages the, um, <clears throat> the forest, forest forest and the harvesting of the timber, they also maintain two contracts with hunters to come in year-round and actively try and manage the population. So they'll they'll trap them and then shoot them and, and dispose of them. And the uh, <clears throat> the ecology lab also has a hunter that comes in and does that. So they split their responsibilities up. So pretty much you have the different portions of the site being managed by different hunters almost all year round in an effort to try and manage the uh, the hog population. And we're we're barely treading water. Joyce Underwood Cab, I don't know who this is for you or her, but if the hogs are that much of a problem, is there a reason, like safety or something, why you don't have a hog hunt? Because I mean, I know they're violent, so. 
uh, Mike McElhinney's DOE, actually the, the hog situation is a nationwide issue. The uh, hogs, there's been a lot of research in a couple years ago, I believe, uh, the Ecology Lab made a presentation on some of the national studies that they're supporting on deploying technology that'll help manage the, the hog population across the country. I think they, I think that was the presentation where they showed Hogzilla, if that term was familiar. Do you remember that? <clears throat> Anyhow, it was within it was within my term as as the DDFO. So, um, if we had to do if the if the population was actually becoming a hazard, yes, we would. But when I drive, I see more deer along the roads than I do hog, and I'm on the site every day, early morning and late evenings when the when the hogs are moving and running about. So I've probably seen hogs alongside the road three times in the 18 years I've been, or 16 years I've been here on the site. On the same line, Betty Cook Cab, I've noticed when we were talking about the wet weather in the swamplands that the hog population has increased because we do the game cameras where you film the deer mm -hmm. and the hogs and they do seem to multiply more in the wet season. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, more to but eat. there's a lot more, and, and mostly at night. Thank you. Anything else, folks? Okay. Thanks, Karen. All right, thanks. One more thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep. <laughs> you remember you What's your name? <laughs> Gil Allensworth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, that was the area. Yeah. So, do we have any questions, comments, concerns on Dr. Rhodes' presentation is the word I'm looking for, or do we want to go right into our recommendations? That might be the best thing to do. Okay. I bet some of those questions and comments and concerns may just come up during the discussion. And I just race. like to state, I guess, for the record, I'm sorry for slagging on the hog presentation because clearly there's a lot of investment in that. So I'm sorry. I'll take it all back. Um, okay, so the first one, do I have to go by the way that it's written on the agenda? No, we can do whatever you want to do in terms of talking about them. Okay, I guess that's the first one anyway. Is the pollinator management plan, do I have to wait for her to bring it up or do I just read it? You can start. Pollinator management plan. Uh, pollinator management plan, recommendation okay. manager Joyce Underwood with humongous props to Larry who's not here. Um, background, pollinators are vital to sustaining life on our planet. Over 95% of the top 100 food crops that make up most of the world's food supply are pollinated by bees and other wildlife. Over the past five decades, there, have been, there has been a dramatic and alarming decline in the number of pollinators. This decline can be attributed to many factors. One, natural disease and colony collapse. Two, decreased food supply and destruction of natural <coughs> habitat. Uh, three, the overuse of impro and improper use of insecticides and herbicides. There's also some debate as to the effect of electromagnetic fields generated by high voltage power lines on pollinator species, particularly bees, and further research into the matter is sorely needed. With an ecosystem as large and diverse as the 310 square miles of the Savannah River site, steps should be made not only to protect but to encourage a healthy pollinator population recommendation. The SRS CAB recommends that the Department of Energy Van River, one, plant wildflowers in the right of ways through the site in order to study the effects of electromagnetic fields on pollinator species. Two, plant pollen generating flowers, trees, and shrubs throughout the site in order to further study the effects of various environmental factors on pollinator species. Flowering sh shrubs could be used for landscape accents around buildings. Pollen-bearing trees such as the tupelo and poplar should be encouraged in wetlands. Three, consider the impact of pollinators before harvesting trees or clearing areas of vegetation. Four, designate one single entity to monitor and approve the application of any and all insecticides, fungicides, herbicide, and herbicides that are used anywhere on the site. This entity should be under the control of the Savannah River Ecology Lab. SREL could work with the local beekeeping organizations for input in the program. 
uh, fire ant control and mosquito control measures should be monitored as well as the activities of any commercial pest control company hired by the site. The Forestry Service and South Carolina Department of Natural Resource Resources should be notified that any chemical applications must be approved. Does anyone have any comments on this one? Um, hi, this is Baker Lloyd with EPA. Hello. Could I interject a couple of comments? Sure. Oh, thank you. Um, EPA is very excited about uh, the chapter recommendation, and um, I just wanted to, I know, I don't know if y'all know, but EPA and DOE have been in talks for a while about pollinator projects, and so we are fully support your uh, recommendation and are glad to see it. And uh, we've been talking with Michael, and Avery actually supplied a picture to us, and we've um, made a fact sheet about it, and uh, DOE has reviewed them. And um, I don't know if y'all seen some of the fact sheets we put them out at uh, some CAP meetings, but we're really excited to hear about the, uh, your pollinator, pollinator recommendation. And um, Michael and everybody at DOE is very supportive of it. We continue talks and are still interested in pursuing the topic. Well, thank you. Dan Kaminsky Cab, I just wanted to say good job that uh, see you broke you broke the streak. So that's excellent. I would support it in the sense too that um, even just beyond just the trimmings and, and things that as uh, activities, both construction and destruction and uh, remediation, anything being, being put back. Uh, could take this into account. I know even when um, solar fields are being put up, you have to control what's growing under those solar fields because it's in your vested interest that they don't overgrow the top of the solar fields. And uh, that being said, everyone's seeking these wonderful, low-growing wildflowers, grasses, and indigenous species to, uh, to make that all happen so that you're not spending a fortune mowing uh, around all those obstacles that a solar field would do, for instance. And I know that uh, DOE uh, and Savannah River have some solar projects. I don't think they're on site, though, correct? Aren't they adjoining? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so, but in, in other aspects, as things are decommissioned and, and left to uh, live out their old age in peace and uh, entombment, uh, anything that could be done in the surrounding areas is all free potential to do something good for the environment because we do have to realize that every single thing that we've done out there has disrupted the the normal natural ecology of the area and anything that we can do to supplement that to put it back the way it was would be better overall for the general community so I guess having said all that um, <laughs> Do you think that what I said is really kind of the gist of it's encompassed in there? That just look for the opportunities. Don't just uh, wait for them to pop up on their own. It's, it's equally cheap to plant weeds as it is to plant grass. And if we are truly sodding the ash caps, that's quite an expensive restoration. And then and entombment compared to uh, what could be done with other seeding projects. True. Thank you. Does anybody else have any input in this? Questions, comments, concerns, improvements, detractions? Uh, Doug Howard Cap. I think it's a great recommendation from what I'm looking at here, and I'm just surprised that you know these things aren't being done already. But uh, this is, to me, I mean, it's a good recommendation to recommend to the full board. You can, you can let her speak if you want to. Yeah, I'll put it in the mic. Municipality member of the public, I love this recommendation. I wrote one similar to it last year. 
And the response back was there is an entity um, for number three. It's the Pollinator Health Task Force. They um, are responsible for it. And I think, I think they gave us that response back. I want to say it was March or April of 2017. Um, and they are, they are planting with the Forest Service, it, I think is the main um, agency responsible for it. But the, that task force, I think, should be the entity. Thank you. Sure, but this is Michael Michelin's DOE. I believe it was closer to about two years ago, but yes, we, we did convene <clears throat> kind of a summit, if you will, to discuss that. So, bearing in those two new pieces of information, do we need to edit this to reflect that, or is it good the way it is? I don't, Dan Kaminsky cab. I don't think you need to really edit much. If anything, it's just uh, obviously to some points they can agree to and supplement with additional information okay. back to us to re-educate us on those topics. Okay. Well, if there is no further discussion on this, we will move forward to Dan Kaminsky's awesome recommendation that he wrote. We need a movers to. Uh, well, what I was vote. thinking, let's let's talk about both of them first, okay. Be, since they're both addressing pollinators. Let let's talk about them in conjunction, and can I see how you feel about that? Um, there are some questions on whether or not these would maybe get merged into one, under our one master management plan recommendation. Uh, so let's explore that a little bit. Let's talk about them both together, and then we can decide how we want to move forward and vote on them. So, uh, Dan Kaminsky Cab, uh, let me preface this by saying there would be no awesome recommendation without Narinder. Uh, he did a lot of the legwork to uh, piece this together with some thoughts that we had discussed in prior CAB meetings. So, um, he put uh, probably two thirds of the words down, and I just tweaked them, and, and hopefully, everyone will see it for what the value we think it has. So this is a draft recommendation to plant indigenous flowering plants on industrial landfills to enhance pollination. Uh, so this is a little more focused to uh, D area, uh, whereas I believe ICES is a more general uh, pollinator strategy. On July 23rd, 2018, DOE provided the CAB a presentation on D area ash project, showing the project boundary of approximately 90 acres. The basin and landfill cover is made up of a geosynthetic cap in accordance with removal action design plan, um, which I believe is referenced on the back. Removal action design plan, RADP, for the 488-4D ash landfill. So I trust all the all that groundwork that Narinder uh, did uh, is correct and appropriate. Um, but that being said, according to the plan, common clean fill was placed on the ash as a foundation covered by a geosynthetic clay layer, GCL, followed by a geosynthetic drainage layer, GDL. These layers were then covered by 20 inch layer of common fill with four inches of topsoil to support grass growth as a natural erosion and protective cover. The grass is mown on a regular basis, so we learned that was semi-annual. Um, to avoid rooting of weeds below the GCL layer. Grass has been planted and mowed schedules have been established. There are a number of fill options available. Uh, so uh, Narinder had referenced an, another recommendation by Serato, which is uh, also in the footnotes. 
was adjusted a uh, top soil layer of six inches. I don't know the specifics of how the rest of that barrier was designed, um, but they're just stating the point that there were some options. On the same day, Dr. Rhodes of the SR Ecology Lab provided the CAB presentation on pollinator activities on the SRS. Rhodes highly recommended the need for growing local varieties of flowering plants at SRS to enhance the habitat for pollinator, pollinators to survive. Rhodes, in a verbal conversation, mentioned that the site remediation team was opposed to planting flowering plants on D area aspiration basin as it will impact the mowing schedule. If not mowed, deep-rooted plants will grow and penetrate the GCL and GDL and damage the cover, which could allow water migration to carry contaminants to the watershed of the site. Discussion. The current design used to, to cap D area is designed to offer 30 or more years of protection and well suited for the purpose. This comes at ongoing costs to mow and maintain the area without benefiting the, benefiting the local ecosystem to any great degree. The local soil conditions to the area, including SRS, are often a sandy soil mixed over a clay at some depth. Any of you homeowners who had to dig in your backyard, you'll probably quickly figure that out, that you will hit clay at some point. Uh, it's noted that the trees are able to I'm not going to Village Creek Drive, and I don't care what you tell me. Uh, it's noted that the trees are able to penetrate the natural clay soil, while many grasses and wildflowers are shallow rooted or not ro robust enough to penetrate the natural clay barrier. So if you've had a natural clay barrier that's relatively close to your surface, you'll see that nothing grows there. If low growing plants are utilized, pop-up trees and other deep rooted species could be monitored and selectively pulled at frequency much lower than mowing grass. These deep rooted plants would easily be seen from a distance for a select removal for select removal before they could penetrate the clay. This approach, which should cost less than regular mowing schedule, provide a more indigenous habitat to local wildlife, i.e. pollinators, and still provide an erosion barrier for the landfill. It should be easy to see a tree, deep rooted weeds coming up among the shorter growth being planted and pulled well before they could ever root deep enough to impact the liner cap. Recommendations coming out of this, uh, consider a des design improvements that include a clay, a clay barrier above the GCL and GDL for future land bills that's so that local flowering plants, clover and grass can be planted and monitored on top of the landfill. Two, consider shallow rooted wildlife, wildflowers, grasses and clover indigenous to the area that would also provide habitat for pollinators. And number three, plant indigenous wildflowers and other pollinator habitat plants surrounding D area, ash basin, and other areas not impacted by GCL, GDL concerns. So in other words, the disrupted areas around where we remediated those areas are, are perfect areas that they have to be uh, uh, somewhat restored to a natural state, and that's a, a natural uh, very easy switch from instead of just planting grass to planting some of the things we're suggesting here without fear of impacting any uh, geosynthetic protective cover. So I see a, a puzzled look on James's face. So it um, was an unrelated thought. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Different puzzling. So after having a few questions, uh, maybe we tweak a couple of these recommendations because um, uh, number one, uh, really this was written out of context of not thinking about burrowing animals, uh, but thinking slightly about burrowing animals. Uh, there are all sorts of natural remedies out there for any critter that's making your life miserable. So whether it's moles or pigs or anything else you can think of, there's something those animals don't like. And if you plant it in abundance, they won't stay there. So if that is an option, I mean, maybe that could be added as well. But uh, uh, I obviously don't know those remedies, but I bet you could probably Google them. <laughs> yeah. I have some questions. Joyce Underwood, cab, because I am not a flower person. I don't know how to grow things, that is. How far down these things you're suggesting, do the roots go, do you know? Like, estimating? 
Dan Kaminsky Cap. I, I honestly don't know. There, there probably is a geologic survey of this area. Uh, I know I've seen a snippet of one in the past that it basically says typically X amount of sand, X amount of clay. So I know we had one of those out at uh, our work site some years ago. And the sand is to keep the burying it. What is the sand? Well, the, I'm sorry. Well, the sand is just here. I mean, it's just here naturally. Right. We're not putting it here. It's we're putting it's, the clay to grow. The so if, if this were in Michigan, where I'm from, it's you would know that you'd have a, a big, healthy, thick layer of topsoil followed by like an aggregate, mediocre dirt, and then hit or miss clay and other nasty things. So it won't grow in the clay. Okay. So yeah. So um, that's why most of our flowering species and stuff are hanging out at the top. Most of them are shallow rooted to begin with, and anything that isn't shallow rooted. Uh, finds a great deal of difficulty getting through that clay barrier. And if uh, people have uh, dug around here enough, you'll <coughs> also notice that um, the tubers and things, those, those pesky vine things that come out just about everywhere at some point. Um, and then they grow these, uh, I don't know if you ever- Those are called air them. potatoes. <laughs> They're what? I think they're called air potatoes. Air potatoes? They're, they're like potatoes that hang. Yeah, they look, yeah. And, and there's all sorts <laughs> of neat things that you can do with those things if you dig them up. but. Um, but that being said, uh, they don't penetrate the clay either. And those are probably one of your worst infiltration things growing down here. So I'm sure there's people way smarter than any one of us on the cab on these topics. And I, th I think it would be a great idea if DOE um, sought out some of those folks to understand what they could plant on top of these besides just grass. Because there are also plenty of wildflowers that you could if, if you wanted it mown down for inspection on a semi-annual basis, uh, you could still mow them down and they'll grow back. I mean, anyone here who's seen uh, logging can clearly attest that things grow back down here uh, quite readily, no matter what you do to them. Uh, Doug Howard Cab. James, were you asking us to see whether or not we, would, we could combine both of these into one or? Ultimately, it's up to you on whether you decide to do that or not. That's true. Uh, but I think that there could be some merit in, in combining them into, into one master recommendation that's addressing your pollinator concerns and covering them, covering all the bases. But if you feel like they're distinct and separate enough, by all means, keep them, keep them apart. Joyce. Joyce Underwood Cab, if we combine them, are we going to have to meet again before we can bring it to the board? Or we can stay here all night. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, Doug, how that's, would that's one factor of it. Sorry, Doug. But um, that's one factor of it that it would have to be a complete rewrite. And I think some of the surrounding discussion and background information can get a little bit, it's going to get long, first yeah. off. Yeah. And uh, I think very importantly, they don't contradict one another. I think is more important than if they supplement one another. Um, so, I, and you know, I was looking at strictly uh, landfill caps, whereas Joyce's recommendation was looking at a general strategy for pretty much everything else on the site. Okay. Uh, Doug Howard Cap. My question would be, if we did, I mean, like you said, are they? Um, do we want to keep this to one pages, or I think isn't that what we're looking for to keep the recommendations to one page? And you know, that's that's not really a hard and fast rule. By all means, if if you were to combine them and you needed to make a long, extensive background, by all means, do it. My suggestion that I often make to you guys about keeping them one page is really just to keep it simple, rather than to go for some really long background recommendation that you then have one sentence worth of recommendation, actual recommendation to. Uh, I have seen that in the past. You can go back in the archives. You can find a five-pager that is wild to read. But in this case, I don't think it would really hit that in this, that milestone. But I think Dan also makes an inter interesting point about keeping them separate um, for the reasons he listed. So it really is up to you and how you want to handle it and how you want to present these issues to the department. Joyce Underwood Cab, I'm kind of 
of the mine to keep them separate, but I do wonder if we go to the full board, if they're going to ask why we didn't combine them. Um, because it's a decent question as they're related. Um, is there any way to kind of like, what am I trying to say? Make the titles of them so explicit as to it takes away any question as to why we did not combine them. Does that make sense? Like, you said that mine was strategic, so I'm like, okay, strategic. So mine, I could add strategic before pollinator, and that makes it, So you know. Dan Kaminsky, Cap. Joyce, good uh, line of thinking there. If we wanted to make them distinct, I think you could just eliminate the to enhance pollination on mine, and then that way it's really talking about uh, indigenous, indigenous flowering plants on industrial landfills, whereas yours is, in essence, kind of completely different at least from a broad subject matter view. Narinda wrote that, but I don't think he'll be offended if we cross it out. Yeah. So we'll just cut that off the title. Yeah, Joyce. Joyce Underwood, Cab. Yeah, I'm looking. Oh, wait, no. I was going to say something, but now it's wrong. It, I mean, it, it talks about pollinators, but not a whole lot. So, yeah, that makes sense to delete that out of there. Now that I've said that, though, it's like everywhere. It's like popping out at me as soon as I said it. Um, I don't know. Does anybody else have any thoughts on this? Questions, comments, concerns, edits? Proofreading. Proofreading. There was a big discussion online about moan versus mode. <laughs> yeah, I saw that, and I didn't know enough to chime in. Doug Howard Cap, do we want to just have the uh, the two authors, uh, you know, kind of get together and see whether or not you all really want to combine them into one and come back, or I don't, uh, Dan Kaminsky Cap, I don't want to merge them. I, I I feel that they're quite distinctly different. Mine touches upon hers with the surrounding areas of the ash basin, kind of overlaps a bit into hers. Um, but the, the other parts is, is really strictly focused on the uh, cap management. I kind of agree with you, Doug Howard Cap, because uh, I kind of get lost a little bit in the translation with yours. Hers a little, is a little more easier, so I think they would probably be better separate. Narinder's a technical guy. So he was able to get some of those technical details out there that I wouldn't have had a chance of ever finding out. Um, so if there's no further discussion, I move that we uh, vote to move these Do to we, the full board. Do we edit before we vote? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I saw like one tiny little thing that is wrong on four. It says, the sentence, SREL could work with the local beekeeping organizations for input in the program. I think it should be input on the program. And then up at the top, uh, number two, <coughs> should be habitats, right? Decreased food supply and destruction of natural habitats, not habitat. Does it matter? Like I don't think in that sense it is at all. Okay, yeah. well we'll just leave it then, but on works better than in. Yeah, okay, I second your motion. <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to do that? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know if the chair couldn't so second just to be motion. Just to be clear, the motion <coughs> was to forward both of them. <coughs> it was. Okay. So it's one vote. 
then you have a second for it. Yeah, second. I don't think that Chelsea set up the electronic vote as one. So, get, mm. yes, yeah, give her a second to. We could do it as separate. Doesn't really matter. Does yeah, no, oh, wait. You, you said to. What? What just happened? <laughs> he motioned to forward both of forward both of them as one rather than vote on them individually. Oh. But when we set up the okay, electronic vote, okay. we set it up as two different votes. I so, see. you can give us 30 seconds or vote on them individually. I thought you meant we were combining them. I'm like, no, we agree. No, no, no. We're not I, know, do that. I know, definitely know you're not going to combine them, and and that's definitely okay. I'm so confused. Oh. But as soon as she gives me the high sign, we can move in and we can open the boat. Do we have any chem members online? Yes, I believe Bobby Williams is online. Is anyone else on the phone? Speak to me, friends. Okay. All right, you're ready, Chelsea. All right. If you would vote yay to send both recommendations, nay to not, and abstain. And then, Bobby, can you tell us what your vote would be? My vote is to send one. That's unfortunately <laughs> that's not the that's not the motion in front of us at the moment. The motion is to send both of them. Thank you. All right, let's close the vote. And it's unanimous. Oh my gosh, I'm so confused. Any other questions or point of discussion that you folks wanted to make? I have a question that I should ask before we voted. That's okay. What's Did your we question? just vote on it as we changed it so his doesn't have to enhance pollination and mine has strategic in, in this front? Instance, Is that what we did? So, <laughs> so let's just cover briefly what, what we're doing at committees when we vote. You're voting on sending this concept. As it is. No. No. This, this concept to the full board. Okay. Between now and then, if you need to make some changes, we can make some changes. It's not hard and fast. As long as you don't change the intent, then we're okay. We can edit it every day. You can send me a draft every day and flood my email with it. It's okay. Um, as long as we keep the intent as it is here. All right. Okay. So. so if there's no other discussions on this, Joyce, do you want to go to public comment? Yes. I want to hear from the public. Can we please hear from the public? I'd like to play with the remote control. Is there any <laughs> public comment from the phone lines? I'm not hearing anything. So, Joyce, do you, unless you have anything else, do you want to close it out? Yes. Thank you all for coming to the meeting of the Facilities Dispensation and Site Remediation Committee. I appreciate all of your attendance and participation, and <coughs> have a good night.